Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. In this lecture, we'd like to summarize some of the uh, basic principles that underlie uh, nuclear uh, reactions. And in particular, we're going to talk about nuclear fission, when a heavy nucleus splits apart and releases, uh, releases energy. Uh, the next lecture will uh, follow up with the discussion about nuclear fusion, which is when you take two light nuclei and you stick them together to form a heavier, heavier nucleus. So uh, to begin with, we probably should just very quickly define what a nuclear reaction is. Um, and it's any process in which two nuclei or the nucleus of an atom plus, let's say, a proton or a neutron from outside the atom uh, collide uh, to produce uh, products that are different from the initial particles that are present. And in the process of a nuclear reaction, usually a tremendous amount of energy is released, as we'll see. Um, it's also important in this lecture to be able to distinguish between atomic and nuclear masses. Uh, we've already discussed this more than once, but again, it's important for you to be able to distinguish between a nuclear reaction, which is written in this format, and a chemical reaction, which tends to be written in this format. Uh, nuclear reactions, uh, uh, in order to analyze nuclear reactions, you need nuclear masses. In order to uh, analyze chemical reactions, you need atomic masses. And the difference between a nuclear mass and the atomic mass of an atom is just the number of electrons that are contained in that atom. So um, to go from a nuclear mass to an atomic mass, I, I just worked through the, uh, the algebra down here. Um, I use uh, uh, capital M to represent atomic masses. I use small m to represent nuclear masses. Experimentally, the atomic masses are measured. Uh, by stripping off one electron, measuring the mass of, uh, of, a, of an atomic uh, ion. Uh, that atomic ion uh, can then be reconstituted into nuclear plus electrons, nuclear masses plus electrons. Uh, the binding energy of the electron to the nuclear mass is usually very small so that we can ignore it. And you end up with some very simple arithmetic here to calculate in this example, what the uh, nuclear mass of a, of a helium-3 nucleus is. So it's important for you to understand that algebra, and I've, I've mentioned it more than once, but um, uh, if, you don't, if, you, if you can't perform those simple calculations, then a lot of the uh, discussion that follows is going to be uh, difficult for you to understand. Uh, the other important uh, uh, ingredient that, that that I'd like to remind you of is this binding energy per nucleon versus nucleon number. So this, this, is the, this is a chart that I've already shown in one lecture. This chart is a little bit more detailed because it picks off the different nuclei. So uh, in this axis, we're plotting the number of nucleons in a nucleus. In this axis, we're plotting the uh, binding energy per nucleon. So we take the nucleus, we calculate its total binding energy, and then we divide that total binding energy by the number of nucleons in the nucleus to get this, this, uh, this axis. And uh, what we find from this plot, when you look at all the, the nucleons that have been discovered, what we find is that the highest binding energy per nucleon occurs at iron. And uh, we then say that iron is the most stable nucleus because when you combine protons and neutrons to form the nucleus of iron, you get the most binding energy per nucleon. Uh, you can see that the chart starts down here with hydrogen, and it ends up here with uranium. So uranium is, is the heaviest uh, naturally occurring element uh, that's stable. Uh, elements above uranium, with, which have a higher, higher number of nucleons than uranium, are unstable, and they eventually decay uh, uh, back into a, a, a atoms that are, uh, or back in the nuclei that are represented in this chart. So the point I'll make is that elements or, or nuclei that are above iron on this chart uh, are less stable than iron. And uh, so there's a natural tendency for these nuclei to return to the most stable nucleus, which, which is that of iron. And the way that is accomplished is by fission. Uh, 
this means that these nuclei tend to uh, split or fall apart and in the process produce nuclei which are ever lighter until eventually iron is reached. Uh, uh, the nuclei that are on this side of iron in this chart um, also have a, a smaller binding energy per nucleon than iron. And for them to become more stable, the way uh, that, that is achieved is by sticking lighter nuclei together. And that process of sticking lighter nuclei together is called fusion. And in the process of fusion, these nuclei march up uh, this, uh, this chart and again approach iron from the, uh, in this case, they approach iron from the bottom. So uh, that, that describes the fusion process. So we'll talk about both these processes uh, in the next two lectures. In this lecture, we'll focus on fission. Um, schematically, the, uh, the fission and the fusion reactions are illustrated in a, in a cartoon fashion uh, in this slide. Uh, fission is when a heavy nucleus becomes deformed. Uh, that deformation occurs because uh, maybe uh, the nucleus absorbs, uh, let's say, a neutron. Uh, the nuclear deformation uh, then results in uh, uh, two lighter nuclei being split off. And uh, in addition to these two lighter nuclei, nuclei uh, there's also neutrons that, are, uh, that tend to be ejected. Uh, for, the, for the fusion reaction, you take lighter nuclei, like in this, this example here, we've got two uh, nuclei of, of deut we've got two atoms of deuterium. If you can bring these two atoms of deuterium close enough together, they form a helium-3 nucleus with a release of one, uh, one neutron. Uh, both fission and fusion reactions uh, release energy, right? So that's a common characteristic of all these nuclear reactions. And, um, and uh, it's that energy that's released that, that of course, is a very uh, that uh, makes this, these nuclear reactions very interesting. Um, to focus on the um, uh, fission reaction, uh, I think the story is best told by focusing on uranium. Um, uranium is actually an element that was discovered a long time ago in 1789. It's the heaviest naturally occurring element in the periodic table. So if you look at the periodic table, um, what you find is hydrogen up here is the lightest nucleus. We've spent a, a, a lot of time talking about the electronic states of hydrogen. If, as you add more uh, protons and neutrons and electrons to form heavier chemical elements, you find that uranium down here is the last stable uh, chemical element. So it's the heaviest, heaviest naturally occurring element in the periodic table. All these elements uh, that uh, have a, an atomic mass heavier than uranium are unstable, and they've only been produced in nuclear reactors or in laboratory uh, uh, reactions. So uranium holds a, a unique position in the periodic table because of this fact. Uh, now there's a, quite a bit known about uranium, but back in the 1930s, not much was known at all. Uh, we now know that there are 26 uh, commonly there are 26 known isotopes of uranium, and these isotopes all have 92 protons, but they have different numbers of of neutrons, and they span atomic mass numbers from 217 to 242. Of these 26 isotopes, there's only three naturally occurring isotopes of uranium, and I list these three naturally occurring isotopes with their known abundances. Uh, of these three naturally occurring isotopes, only two uh, play a, a role in the discussion of fission, and that's the U-238 uh, isotope and the U-235 isotope. So the U-235 isotope naturally only is uh, about three quarters of a percent of all uranium that's mined. Uh, the rest uh, by the predominant amount is this U-238 uh, which in terms of fission uh, nuclear reactions isn't uh, terribly interesting. Uh, so the, um, the, uh, the emphasis today is to uh, uh, take uh, the, the U-238, 99% naturally occurring isotope, and somehow enrich it to produce uh, uranium, which has got enhanced levels of U-235. It's important to distinguish between two grades of, of uranium. 
One is known as reactor grade uranium, and that's when you enrich the naturally occurring U-238 such that it contains about 4% of U-235. Uh, that's the reactor grade uranium, and it's used in nuclear reactions. Um, the other uh, uh, grade of uranium, uranium is known as weapons grade uranium. That's when you take the naturally occurring U-238 and you enrich it uh, such that it contains about 85% of U-235 isotope. So that's a weapons grade uh, uh, uranium and that's used to, uh, to make nuclear weapons. Um, the other point I'll make in this discussion, it's often not discussed, uh, but uh, the enrichment process where you take naturally occurring uranium and you uh, slowly enhance the, U, uh, the amount of U-235, that enrichment process itself requires a tremendous amount of energy. And so um, while it's true that once the, the uh, uranium is enriched, it, its properties become interesting, uh, the amount of time and the amount of energy required to perform this enrichment is, is quite large, requires a tremendous amount of uh, electrical power and uh, long periods of time in order to achieve the enrichment process. If you uh, want to understand something about how this fission process was discovered, I have to very briefly review some uh, experiments that were done in the 1930s. This was an extremely interesting period in the history of physics because the, uh, the idea of a nuclear reaction was, was uh, slowly being discovered. And uh, this discovery spanned the, the time period from roughly 1930 to 1940. Uh, one of the important uh, experiments along the way was performed by Enrico Fermi and his team in Italy. Uh, what they did is they, they took uh, naturally occurring uranium foil, they bombarded it with uh, neutrons, and uh, they attempted to produce uh, trace amounts of the next element above uranium in the periodic table. So that element had not yet been discovered in 1932. And what they tried to do is they, they tried to produce that uh, next element, which, which we now call Neptunium-93, right? They tried to produce trace amounts of that in the uranium foil. Uh, they, uh, they employed uh, chemical analysis techniques to look for the, uh, the Neptunium, and uh, they were unsuccessful. They were not able to find any, uh, any evidence for uh, elements greater than uh, uranium in the uranium foil due to this bombardment of neutrons. So the experiment was kind of viewed as uh, 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 unsuccessful. Uh, a couple years after Fermi's experiments, uh, this light isotope of U-235 was actually discovered at the University of Chicago. So while Fermi and his crew were, were uh, 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 bombarding uh, uranium foil with neutrons, uh, they, they had assumed that the uranium was, was all 100% U-238. Uh, that picture changed in 1935 when it was discovered that about three quarters of a percent of naturally occurring uranium uh, occurs in this isotope of U-235. Um, Fermi's experiments were essentially repeated in 1938 by Hahn and Strassmann in Germany, and in 1939 by Meitner, who was actually a colleague of Hahn and Strassmann. Meitner had to leave Germany, and she started to work with uh, Frisch, I believe, in Copenhagen. So uh, in, in late 1938, early 1939, these two groups uh, performed experiments very similar to Fermi's experiments, uh, but what they realized was that there were elements lighter than uranium in the uranium foil after uh, neutron bombardment. Uh, so this was really a, a quite a surprise because, if, if you recall, Fermi was looking for elements heavier than uranium. Uh, Hahn and Strassmann get the credit for, uh, for first pointing out that uh, the neutrons did in fact cause a, a nuclear reaction to occur, but the byproduct of that nuclear reaction was elements lighter than uranium. So um, that was a really huge discovery, and, and Hahn actually received the Nobel Prize in 1944 in chemistry for that, that uh, experiment. Uh, within a year, uh, Bohr, uh, uh, who was in, actually in the United States, um, 
he articulated the importance of this new U-235 isotope in producing these lighter uh, 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 elements in, in the Hahn and Strassmann experiment. And so uh, in 1939, Bohr and Wheeler published this uh, seminal paper called The Mechanism of Nuclear Fission. And what they, what they explained was they explained that if you take a low energy neutron and it collides with a U-235 nucleus, the nucleus absorbs that neutron, it becomes very unstable, it produces a U-236 isotope, which is very unstable, and that isotope then splits into two lighter fragments uh, with the release of excess uh, neutrons, plus uh, the release of a, a tremendous amount of energy per, uh, per nuclear reaction. So this was the, uh, this was the uh, mechanism that, that Bohr and Wheeler proposed uh, in, their, in their paper, and it relied on the fact that U-235 uh, preferentially absor absorbed low-energy uh, neutrons and uh, produced an unstable nucleus that, that then actually split in two. So that was, uh, that was the uh, discovery and then a theoretical explanation of nuclear fission. It all occurred in the 1938-1939 time frame. Uh, a lot of people throughout the world picked up on this idea, and uh, it quickly became apparent that there were many end products that were possible when uh, low-energy neutrons were absorbed by the U-235 nucleus. Uh, in all these uh, nuclear reactions, the U-235 nucleus is converted to U-236, which is extremely unstable, and that U-236 then decays into uh, two smaller fragments, but in the process, it releases uh, uh, two or three neutrons, and uh, it also releases on the order of 200 million electron volts of, of, of kinetic energy in these, in these different byproducts. So these, uh, this 200, uh, 200 MeV of, of energy released is released from one atom, okay, which is an incredibly high, uh, high amount of energy coming out from a nuclear reaction. So that was very surprising. And the, uh, the other surprising result was that there were more than one neutron that was released. And this, this fact that more than one neutron was released uh, gives rise to this concept of a chain reaction, which I try to illustrate uh, in this part of the slide. And uh, basically what happens is if one neutron strikes a U-235 nucleus, that U-235 can fission into two smaller fragments, release a tremendous amount of energy, but in the process it also releases two to three neutrons. Some of these neutrons are going to interact with U-238, and that's not very interesting. Uh, some of the neutrons are actually going to escape, right? So they'll, they'll be released. But uh, some of the neutrons that are generated will interact with another U-235 nucleus. And this, uh, this second reaction then produces uh, an identical uh, nuclear reaction as the first uh, with the release of two to three additional neutrons. These two or three additional neutrons then have a certain probability of interacting with other U-235 nuclei, right? Each of these uh, nuclear reactions release two to three nuclear neutrons. And so what you end up with is you end up one neutron in, you end up with an exponential multiplication of low energy neutrons out, and this is referred to as the chain reaction. Now, each of, these, uh, each of these nuclear reactions here release on the order of uh, 200 million electron volts worth of energy. So uh, if you're exponentially multiplying the number of uh, nuclear reactions that can occur, uh, you're exponentially multiplying the amount of energy that's released, and that implies that there's a tremendous amount of energy that can be uh, 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 generated if one of these chain reactions can actually be achieved. Uh, what we now know is we now know that uh, the uh, distribution of the U-235 fission fragments is, is distributed over a wide uh, mass number. And I just tried to make the case here that uh, whenever a neutron uh, is absorbed by U-235, the end products are not completely uh, uh, predictable. There's a distribution of end products possible. Uh, the fission fragments tend to peak at about 
uh, seven or eight percent efficiency around atomic mass numbers of 95 and 140, uh, but other mass numbers are clearly possible at, at reduced uh, reduced levels of yield. So uh, uh, that that this slide here is just a, a direct reflection of the fact that there are many end products that are possible when this uh, this neutron is absorbed by the U-235 nucleus. If the neutron is absorbed by the U-238 nucleus, none of this happens. It's not, not terribly interesting. And in fact, it's this, this unstable U-236 nucleus uh, that, that is responsible for the, uh, the nuclear fission reaction. So that's important. Uh, it's an important fact for you to understand. Um, this discovery of fission in 1938-1939 was extremely surprising. It caused a tremendous amount of uh, interest worldwide. Um, part of the problem was, part of the issue was that uh, Germany was uh, ramping up military operations at a, at a, very, uh, uh, a very quick pace. Uh, the United States and Europe was, was, was basically trying to catch up. And there was a there was a, a, a real fear that uh, if Germany uh, understood how this nuclear reaction uh, worked, they could uh, build weapons that would basically guarantee their dominance of, of the world. So the United States countered with uh, a, a very severe, a very intense scientific program to try to control and understand this fission reaction. Uh, why was it so surprising, right? Uh, a lot of people didn't believe it. And the reason they didn't believe it was up until 1938, uh, the, the basic understanding was that a nucleus uh, could reduce its mass, but you'd, it would reduce its mass by chipping away, let's say, an alpha particle, right? And there would be a, a, just a small mass decrement in the daughter nucleus as the alpha particle was emitted. Uh, this nuclear reaction here, this radioactive decay event, uh, released tens of mil millions of electron volts per energy per, per radioactive decay. Uh, you have to contrast that with the discovery of nuclear fission, in which um, um, now the, the parent nucleus decayed into two smaller fragments, and in the process, hundreds of millions of electron volts of energy were released. So there was a... a, a uh, 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 literally a splitting of the nucleus as opposed to a chipping away from the nucleus, and there was a tremendous amount of energy released, and those two, uh, those two uh, 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 issues uh, ignited a huge interest worldwide. Um, the, uh, the effort in the United States was to first uh, uh, control this nuclear chain reaction, and uh, so Fermi and his team were assembled at the University of Chicago uh, with the, uh, the, the uh, goal to produce a, a, a nuclear reactor where they could actually control uh, the number of fission events in a, in a, in a reasonable way. And uh, what they did is they built what is referred to as, as CP1. This is referred to as the Chicago Pile 1. It was a it was a, a honeycomb of graphite blocks and uh, uranium fuel. The uranium fuel uh, uh, contained both uranium oxide and uranium metal. Um, the uh, the placement of the uranium fuel fuel within the carbon blocks had to be optimized. So there was a there was a, a, a geometrical uh, optimization problem that had to be solved. And uh, in addition, they, uh, they used uh, uh, control rods that naturally absorbed uh, the neutrons that were emitted from these uh, uh, uranium uh, 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 blocks that were uh, interspaced throughout the carbon, la uh, carbon uh, uh, reactor. And uh, as these control rods were withdrawn, the number of neutrons that were absorbed by the control rods decreased and uh, the probability then that these excess neutrons would produce additional nuclear reactions increased. And uh, by carefully withdrawing the control rods, they were able to uh, produce the first controlled nuclear uh, chain reaction. So there's some interesting pictures that you can find on the web. Uh, 
It's, it's estimated that this initial experiment in controlled nuclear fission required about $2.7 million to produce. It took hundreds of thousands of pounds of graphite, uh, took uh, tens of thousands of pounds of uranium metal and uranium oxide. Uh, it took a couple of years to, to, uh, to build the, uh, the equipment up and um, it, it produced about 200 watts of steady power when the control rods were withdrawn. Uh, there's actually no pictures of the, uh, of, of the uh, reactor. These are sketches that you can find on the web. Uh, the entire project was, of course, uh, uh, high, high secrecy. Uh, uh, only a need-to-know basis was, uh, was maintained. If you're interested in the details, I did find a patent application that was filed in 1955 by Fermi and his team. Right. If you uh, if you uh, you're really interested in this, you can you can look up this patent application and uh, find out a lot of the details about how this nuclear reactor was actually built. Um, so the, the the story 75 years later, after uh, this this nuclear fission reaction was discovered, right, was that uh, uh, if U-235 absorbs a low energy neutron. It can uh, produce two fragments, plus excess neutrons, plus a tremendous amount of energy. These excess neutrons are then very efficient and in, in can be, with, with care, these excess neutrons can then interact with additional U-235 nuclei to maintain a nuclear reaction uh, uh, that's stable over time. Um, the nuclear reactions that occur can be roughly split into two categories. There's the uncontrolled nuclear uh, reaction, which produces an atomic weapon. Uh, what we now know is that you need a critical mass of about 50 kilograms of U-235. This critical mass of uranium has to be assembled into a spherical diameter that's about 17 centimeters, uh, uh, 17 centimeter diameter. And if you can, if you can do that, uh, then you'll, um, you'll produce a chain reaction that runs away and causes a massive explosion. You can also produce controlled nuclear reactions using uh, the fission uh, reactor. And uh, of course, this was first demonstrated in 1942, and it's now a viable way to, uh, to uh, heat steam or to produce steam. The steam turns uh, an electric uh, turbine, and the turbine then uh, drives a generator which, which produces electricity that can be distributed uh, uh, on the grid. Just a real quick word about nuclear reactors in the U.S. Um, according to the web, there's about 62 operating nuclear power plants in the USA. Uh, the oldest one um, in operation uh, actually came into service in 1969. So uh, there's been 30-some uh, years of, of nuclear power in the U.S. Uh, because of, of uh, regulatory restrictions, the last nuclear reactor to come online was in 1996. That was in Tennessee. And there are op optimistic estimates on the web that perhaps uh, another nuclear reactor also located in Tennessee will come online in December of 2015. So uh, we'll have to wait and see if, um, if that actually occurs. But uh, these nuclear reactors do contribute uh, electricity and, uh, and uh, are a viable way to generate energy uh, in a controlled, uh, uh, controlled way. So that's a real brief overview of nuclear fission uh, and why it's interesting and how roughly a very simple de de description of how it, how it developed. Up next, we're going to uh, uh, talk more about nuclear fusion and uh, talk about how nuclear fusion uh, allows us to understand the tremendous amount of energy that's released from uh, stars in the, uh, in the galaxy. So uh, uh, come on back and uh, listen to that discussion. That'll be our next topic. Thank you a lot.